Hello. Our next speaker, L. Pearson, graduated in December from the Professional Mental Health to the graduate school here at Lewis and Clark from a background in activism. She was interested in the field of mental health and knew that there were not enough clinicians of color, not enough who looked like her. She knew that many professionals in the field were not adequately prepared to address effectively the kinds of traumas that people in communities of color often face. At the same time, she knew that the profession was changing for the better. She believed that she could, with her knowledge, commitment, and experience, become a part of that change. She enrolled and engaged with our counseling program. Faculty members who worked with her admired her strengths as a counselor. One said, quote, as a student in class discussions, Elle brought deep experience in various community settings to bear on her comments, especially around issues of multicultural understanding and organizing for social justice. She was firm in her uh, convictions, but truly open to dialogue. We know that Elle is already contributing to the profession. We are proud to have her as our student commencement speaker. Please welcome Elle Pearson. Good day and salutations, friends, family, faculty, and graduates. First off, I want to acknowledge, y'all have done this before, that you kind of probably know what to expect, that there's an algorithm to these things, to these speeches. And, well, I've done a little research, especially since I'm in graduate school and all, right? Um, and this is what I learned about commencement speeches. One, Winona LaDuke, Raina Gossett, John Lewis, Michelle Obama, Grace Lee Boggs, Elizabeth Warren, Lynn Miranda Manuel, just to name a few, have given outstanding addresses. Google, when you need a little inspiration. Two, being funny works really well. I'm not going to be able to do that one today. Three, based upon those speeches and many others, life is hard. We are lucky. We will fall. Get back up, even if you need to ask for help. Four, what I couldn't find were speeches from our collaborators to us. What do I mean by collaborators? Those folks we often quickly make reference to as our students, clients, patients, or the population we serve. What do they want to say to us on graduation day? Since I couldn't find what I was looking for, I asked. Um, <laughs> I asked the folks that I was collaborating with at my internship. I cannot overemphasize the importance of my internship experience. I was provided a remarkable learning opportunity. In an environment I felt both supported and challenged in my development as a therapist and a student. My internship site was here in Portland at a local drug and alcohol treatment center. Many of the folks receiving services there have a history of complex trauma, systemic marginalization, and recent incarceration. Their lives, often directed by decisions others have made about or for them. Please note, my sample size is small, has not been approved by the IRB, and would not meet standards for a true experiment. <laughs> Hopefully, with the research methods class y'all took, you can silently, yes, silently, list the ways that this would not pass research mustard. Now that you've done that, here's what I was encouraged to share today. The question was the following. What would you say to folks like myself and others who have earned a graduate degree and will be entering the fields of education and counseling? One, 
Thank you. We need more good folks. Two, don't give so many bad grades. Bad grades didn't help me get good ones. Three, remember who you were before you got that paper. Four, don't label me before you know me. Five, your opinion might end up with me for a lifetime. Per usual, I was humbled listening to them and grateful for their willingness to participate in my learning. As I went through the responses, the theme I distilled was about power. I realized at this point in time in our country, the topic of power is salient. However, it would be remiss of me to not mention that power has been a salient topic for many of us for a long time. As our communities have been intimately touched by violence that is used to establish and exert power over. That violence includes, but not limited to, treaty violations, destruction of sacred land, mass incarceration, denying access to human rights and needs such as a public bathroom, forced separation from family, lead contaminated water. And that's just today. The examples I've provided may lead to a feeling of powerlessness, especially when many of us as new professionals will enter our career through the doors of these systems of oppression. This is where I challenge us and ask us to listen to our collaborators. Take notice of power. I promise to not deconstruct the word power on this stage today. However, we use the words oppressed and oppression to name what is occurring to folks. We must acknowledge the power it takes to oppress and the power that is needed to be an alliance. The concept I bring forth for consideration is not a new idea. It is the examination of power over versus power with. I ask for you to consider what happens to your work if you apply the concepts of power with instead of power over. This is not the cliche superhero reference <laughs> of power for good or evil. It is resistance to one of the strongest components of systemic oppression the struggle to have power over another human being. The next question in this exercise. When we resist structures of power over with our collaborators and instead have power with them, isn't it ourselves we set free? A quote by Lila Watson, an Aboriginal activist, you have likely heard before, and it's still worth sharing, illustrates the point. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. Thank you and congratulations.